Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled, The Three Cosmic Messages. Now, if you've been an Adventist for very long or you're familiar with Adventism, you'll understand that's probably talking about the three angels' messages. This is lesson number seven in this series from May 13 of 2023, entitled, Worshiping the Creator. We'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, as we approach you once again, recognizing your continual presence and protection, we ask now that you'll help us to recognize the importance of the fact that you are our Creator. And how many today would question that or absolutely deny it? Help us to understand the truth here and present it in a way that's convincing is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen. How often do you stop and think about all the things you just take for granted? That's especially true about things which you've always known and expected to be there. Uh, I think some of us would say, Mom, <laughs> that would be a start. But think of the sun, the sky, air, or even the ground beneath your feet. I've been listening to a recording and uh, looking at a book about um, how things came about from a person who is um, struggling from, well, I don't think he's struggling, but I think he's trying to present both sides. It's very interesting to hear all the crazy notions about where this earth came from, for example. Well, have you ever stopped to ask the existential questions, those questions which are about, do we really exist or how can we really exist? Why is there something instead of nothing? Jim? Why does our universe itself and all the majesty and grandeur and astonishing things in it exist to begin with? What great logical contradiction would occur were our universe and we who are in it not, he not here? According to the latest scientific theory that it, they, they tend to change, our universe once did not exist. exist excuse me. In other words, ours is a contingent existence and is a miracle that we are here at all. And despite all sorts of myths about the universe arising from absolutely nothing or from some kind of mathematical equation, our universe exists because God, the Creator, has made it and everything in it. From the Bible Study Guide for May 6. Yes, okay. Have you ever wished that you could visit the island of Pabbas, where John was imprisoned near the end of his life? I have had that privilege, and it was, I consider, a real great privilege. John, along with the other disciples, had witnessed Christ's ascension into heaven. Kerry? Uh, taking Acts 1-9, after saying this, he, Jesus, was taken up to heaven as they watched him, and the cloud hid him from their sight. It's from American Bible Society in 1992. The Good News Bible, yes. Before John was sent to the island of Patmos, they had tried to kill him by casting him into a cauldron of boiling oil. I tried to imagine what that would be like. Couldn't be very pleasant. But he did not die. God was not finished with him yet. Gordon? From the writings of Ellen White, John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil, but the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant, even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. Very similar, isn't it? Yeah. As the words were spoken, thus perish all who believe in that deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, John declared, my master patiently submitted to all that Satan and his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored in being permitted to suffer for his sake. I am a weak, sinful man. Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. These words had their influence and John was removed from the cauldron by the very men who had cast him in. Again, the hand of persecution fell heavily upon the apostle. 
By the emperor's decree, John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, condemned, quote, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1.9. Here, his enemies thought his influence would no longer be felt and he must finally die of hardship and distress from Acts of the Apostles, page 570. Well, we don't know for sure. There's pretty good evidence that <clears throat> all the writings of John, the Revelation, the Gospel of John, and the three letters all came after he was, you know, banished to the Isle of Patmos. They thought they were getting rid of his influence forever. Crazy. So they came after he survived the boiling oil. Yes. In writing his last letter to young Timothy, Paul said, 2 Timothy 3, 12, <coughs> Everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now you could see where, why Paul might say that, considering his story. Uh, is that still true? I think so. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll Increasingly so. hang on and see. Although we do not have complete records, it seems that every one of the remaining 11 disciples, those besides Judas, of course, we know what happened to him, suffered a martyr's death except John, who finally died at a very old age in Ephesus. And I've also had the privilege of visiting the place where there's a, the, the base, I mean, uh, the floor level of the church, just the floor is left, and there's a, a place where you can go down under. You can't go down under, but a place where there's a passage down underneath the, the floor there. And they say that this church was built there because that was John's, John Barrel's spot. It's possible it was true. While John was on the island of Patmos, apparently in a cave on the side of the mountain, the Lord appeared to John and gave him the messages we are studying in the book of Revelation. By outlining many of the issues in the great controversy, the book of Revelation points out repeatedly that we need to worship God who, uh, and to hold him in great reverence and respect if we're going to inherit eternal life. Our Bible study guide puts it this way, we were created as worshiping beings. Every one of us worships something or someone. True worship, the worship of the creator, enables us to discover life's true purpose. It gives us a reason for living. It gives us not only something to die for, but also even more significantly, something to live for and if need be to endure tribulations for. And indeed, as the final crises, crises arise, we will better understand that we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God, Acts 14, 22, from our Bible study guide for Sunday. In that verse, Jim? Acts 14, verse 22. They, that is Paul and Bar Barnabas, strengthened the believers and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. We must pass through many troubles to enter the kingdom of God, they, th they taught Good News Bible. If all the disciples suffered these kinds of troubles, should we be surprised that the devil will try to trouble us, even kill us, in the final days of this world's history? Carrie? Using First Peter four twelve to fifteen, my dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful tests you are suffering, as though something unusual were happening to you. Rather, be glad that you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may be full of joy when His glory is revealed. Happy are you if you are insulted because you are Christ's followers. This means that the glorious Spirit, the Spirit of God, is resting on you. If any of you suffer, it must not be because you are a, mur a murderer or a thief or a criminal or a, mer a meddler, rather, in other people's affairs. That's okay. quite, a, quite a combination. Yeah. Meddler with other people's affairs, that goes along with murderers and thieves and criminals. Sometimes it's hard to know if someone is being attacked or persecuted because of they're standing for God or because they're standing for themselves. Yeah. It's especially hard when it's, when you're the person. Yeah. The first angel's message ends with these very important words. Worship him 
who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water from our Good News Bible. So we have been told again and again throughout the Bible we must learn to worship God. Jim? John. Oh, I'm sorry. John 1, to, John verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without Him. Good News Bible. Okay, and some of you are aware that there are certain church groups that don't believe in the um, eternal existence of Jesus, especially before he was here on this earth, and they translate those verses in a, in a different way. Um, you want to go ahead and give us Romans 1.20 as well? Or okay. ever, since the, ever since God created the world, his invisible qualities, both his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen. They are perceived in the things that God has made. So those people have no excuse at all from the Good News Bible. So is it obvious to you from the things that you see in nature that God is a creator? Yes. There's some pretty amazing things and I, I can tell you, as I have said, I've been studying this one author and he just points out again and again so many things are being discovered by science that show that it would be Im completely impossible. Evolution, as it's usually understood, would be completely impossible. And yet there's some things in nature that um, yeah. make it obvious that the devil's around. Oh yes, yeah, that's not to say that the devil is not here. Okay, Myra? Genesis 1-1. In the beginning when God created the universe, that's from the Good News Bible. The Bible study guide, uh, what's, when is this for? For Monday, May 8. In, um, to get just a small idea of how unlimited God's power is, let's consider one object in His creation, the sun. The sun produces more energy in one second than humanity has produced in oil, gas, coal, or fire since the beginning of time. <laughs> it's wow. quite amazing. The sun has a diameter of approximately 865,000 miles. It could hold one million planets this, the size of the Earth, but the sun is just one of at least 100 billion stars in our galaxy and the Milky Way. One star, called the Pistol Star, gives off as much as 10 million times the power generated by our sun. Wow. Wow. One million stars the size of our sun can easily fit inside the sphere of the pistol star. Whew. I have questions <laughs> about that. Um, how do we even begin to wrap our minds around the creation? Creation reveals a God of awesome might and unlimited power his creative power not only brought the heavens and the earth into existence, but also has worked in behalf of his people through the centuries. He is the God who, would, who began this world, who, ever present, who is ever present in this world, and who will never forsake his people in this world. Despite I'm, how small... Go ahead. Okay. Despite how small we are in contrast to the creation... Christ died for us. How does the overwhelming size of creation only amplify the reality of God's love? Again, that's for the Bible study guide for Monday, May 8. When you look at that and you think about that and you think about the progress of the, the, the great controversy as we understand it, God is going to come and make this little spot his future headquarters. That's what we believe. The amazing fact is that this God who created the entire universe reaches down and wants to have a personal relationship with us as human beings. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 puts it this way, anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. And Psalms 139, 15 and 16, when my bones were being formed, carefully put together in my mother's womb. 
when I was going there in secret, you knew that I was there. You saw me before I was born. The days allotted to me had all been recorded in your book before any of them ever began. So what did, what is, I think it was David who wrote this, although I, I don't remember for sure. He had quite an idea about the omniscience of God, didn't he? About how much God understands. But he wasn't the only one. Jim, you want to jump in there, Acts 17? Acts 17, verses 24 and 28. Paul said to the people of Athens, God, who made the world and everything in it, is Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples made of human hands, nor does he need anything that we can supply for working him by working for him, since he is himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. From one human being, he created all races of the earth from, and made them live throughout the whole earth. He himself fixed beforehand the exact times and the limits of the places where they live. He did this so that they could look for him and perhaps find him as they felt about for him, yet God is actually not far from any one of us, as someone has said. In him we live and move and exist. It is some of your poets, excuse me, it is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children from the Good News Bible. Do you have any idea where this poet, who this poet was and when he lived that made the comment, we too are his children? Around 600 B.C., in Greece. Around 600, I've forgotten the man's name, but that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Colossians 1.17, Christ existed before all things, and in union with him all things have their proper place. The Bible speaks of God's omnipresence. We believe that he inhabits, I'm sorry, inhabits all of space. He is aware of everything that happens to us, even everything we think, speak, and do. And in his prayer just before his crucifixion, Jesus said, I guess that would be Carrie. Yes. Um, quoting from John 17, verse 23. I in them and you in me, so that they may be completely one, in order that the world may know that you sent me and that you loved them as you loved me. It's from the Good News Bible. I want to step back for just a moment and talk about God being able to keep track of everything. That becomes more and more of a challenge as you think, of, as you get a little older. It's harder to keep a whole lot of different things all going on in your brain at the same time. For one person. Love yes, one. yes, on exactly. Does it scare you to think that God is so powerful and so omniscient? Why would God associate immense power with his care for each one of us? He wants to char change us so that we can become part of his eternal kingdom. And Ellen White has an amazing statement about that. From Great Controversy, page 555, paragraph 1. It is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Again, Ellen White, Great Controversy 555. Okay, so what does that tell us? What are we putting in our brains through our five senses all day long, every day? And through our thinking. And through the thinking, yeah, which we're, we're sort of integrating all those things we put in our brains. Our, our minds, and think of all the people who do nothing all day long except entertainment. Yeah. And, and what, what is going on in their brains? What kind of, what kind of you know, useful information is going to come out of that? Well, if, it's, if you use the word amusement instead of entertainment, it's pretty explanatory. <laughs> yeah. A, against, muse thinking, 
state of mind. Yeah. Isn't that, is, is that a proper f translation of, of no, amusement? Like that, Against yeah. thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can be changed on a day-by-day -day basis as we think about God, as we worship Him, as we pray to Him, and as we read our Bibles, filling our minds with the truth about Him. That would have a quite an impact, wouldn't it? The first angel's message talks about three things together. They're all mentioned in a verse and a half or something there. One, the everlasting gospel. Two, our judgment. And three, worshiping the Creator. How are these related? In Romans 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. Good news, Bible. Okay. The everlasting gospel, our judgment, worshiping the Creator. Now we have Romans 8. There's no condemnation for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. Are those four different topics or are they somehow related? Apparently John thought they were later related. Um, I mean, they all go together. Yeah. The truth is everlasting. And so the judgment will be to, will be there to 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 find to choose to to determine who is willing to to live in that kind of an environment. That Romans eight one to yeah. be in union with that's a state of atonement, is yeah. it? I mean, just as plain as it could be. Mm -hmm. It is very interesting to observe that just as the Seventh Day Adventist Church was being formed and beginning its incredible growth, the world was turning to evolution. We know that Ellen White had her first vision. Well, I should say, but even before that, what came to be known as the Great Disappointment, they thought Jesus was coming back in 1844. And a very short time later, Ellen White had her first vision. And in that same year, what else happened? Charles Darwin Charles wrote. Charles Darwin wrote his book, which he was afraid to publish. He didn't publish it for 15 more years. And then he only published it because Somebody else was about to publish the same kind of material. And he said, well, I, I did that 15 years ago. I better publish it quick before somebody else gets ahead of me. Yeah. Well, why is evolution such a big deal? Now let's talk about evolution a little bit. Those who believe in evolution are trying to explain to us that God may not exist. Or if he does exist, he does not impact our lives. Our three angels' messages to the world focus on the fact that he was and is creator and sustainer of every one of us. The passage we read a little while ago from Acts 17 says, what? God is the one who keeps us alive. Every one of us. Well, what, what does it say in Ephesians 3, 9 and 10? I think that's yours. I'm sorry. Ephesians 3, 9 and 10. And of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect, God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages, in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and the powers of the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. Okay, I can go ahead and take the next one. Colossians. 1, 13 to 17, he res rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us safe into the kingdom of his dear son, by whom we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn son, and that firstborn right there means the most important son, superior to all created things. For through him God created everything in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. I never have quite figured out exactly who's, who's included in all that. Lords, rulers, and spiritual powers and authorities. But anyway, God created the whole universe through him and for him. Christ existed before all things, and in union with him, all things have their proper place. Jim? Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were given existence and life. From the Good News Bible. 
So if we believe in God's foreknowledge, we must accept the incredible idea that the Godhead understood, even before they created us, what we would cost them. Is that, 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 that just blows my mind. He, did God have it all laid out? He knew what, what it was going to cost, what it would happen, what were the conclusions and so forth, before he even created us. That implies that he knew that Lucifer would successfully tempt Eve and Adam, mm -hmm. that they would fall and on down through history. Yeah. Okay. Well, the rest of the universe already understood that, but they needed to see another audiovisual aid again, mm -hmm. right? Well, we... Sin was already here before the earth was created. No. I, it was in the universe before... Well, in the universe, yeah. Well, okay, so... And, and Satan was not far behind getting here. Yeah. So... Yeah, sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what, what we, the universe didn't know, which is the other part of the story, is how it's going to deal with it. it in how your how God is involved. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was accused of being arbitrary, vengeful, and forgiving, exacting, severe, tyrannical, despotic, so forth. All those awful things. Yeah. yeah. Think of all the things Satan has accused God of. Yeah. Okay. Where are we, Carrie? Yeah. Look at how closely tied Jesus as Creator is to Jesus as Redeemer. The moment that his role as Creator is diminished as the theory of evolution inevitably does, his role as our redeemer comes into question as well. Jesus comes to redeem us from sin, from death, from suffering, and from violence when sin, death, suffering, and violence are, as evolution teaches, the very means of creation itself. God redeems us from the very process he used to create us to begin with. It's a dangerous lie. Mm -hmm. and what makes it even worse is that the evolution mocks the very idea of Jesus' death on the cross. Why? Paul, and it's got here, see Romans 5, 17 to 19. Paul is inseparably linked, links the introduction of sin by Adam to the death of Jesus. There's a direct link then between Adam and Jesus. In any ev evolution model, however, no sinless Adam could have introduced death because death, millions of years of death, was supposedly the force and power that was needed to create Adam to begin with. Hence, right from the start, evolution destroys the biblical foundation of the cross. In contrast, Seventh-day Adventists, by calling the world to worship the Creator, stand as a living witness against this error. That's from the Adult Sabbath Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, May 10. Okay, so how good are we doing? How are we doing? How, how good a job are we doing at getting the world straightened out on the issue of evolution? Are we being very successful? <laughs> However, the incredible truth is that the creator of this entire universe came to this little world and was willing to die to demonstrate many of the truths we must understand in the great controversy. Ellen White from Desire of Ages wrote, Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with a terrible weight of guilt he bears, that is, at the cross, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Yeah. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by men. 
So great was this agony, that is the agony of separation from the Father, that his physical pain was hardly felt. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. I want us to, to dwell on that thought for a moment. What had, Je what had happened to Jesus already so far? He'd been beaten almost to death. Mm -hmm. He'd and, and with all these, his whole back was just bleeding, I'm sure, pouring blood out because of all the, they, those whips they used to, to beat people with have little, sometimes lead or other little pieces of metal uh, at the tips of them to tear and, and so forth. He had a crown of thorns. What else? No, no, no sleep the night before. No. What else? Had he been pierced at that point? No, not yet. That was a little bit later. But, but it's, to me, it seems a marvel that he even survived his backlash. Yeah. There was a book somewhere I read a while back. This uh, back east, one of the leading coroners in the around in the states, and he more or less marvelled at it. I don't remember his name, but he yeah. should normally would have bled to death. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we know from the writings of Bell White particularly, although you can put it together, if you put two different Gospels together and you compare the stories, Jesus fell dying in the Garden of Gethsemane yeah, yeah. because of the stresses that were upon him. He was sweating blood. What does that do to you? I mean, it might be visible on the skin. What's going on all, what's going on all through your body when that happens? It's in trouble. Major. Some kind of trouble, you think? <laughs> Deep trouble. Yeah. yeah. If you get a little, a little bit of bleeding just inside your brain, what happens? Gordon, you're the... Wipes out. Wipes you out, yeah. So here's Jesus having gone through all of that, basically died in the Garden of Eden, in Garden of Gethsemane, I'm sorry, having been resuscitated by an angel who came from heaven, going through all this, and now he finds that he, because he can't feel the presence of his Father... In other words, his father is removing himself from the son, and that's what he that's what we do when we when we choose to sin. We're asking God to leave us. His all that physical pain was hardly felt. All he could think about was the fact that his father he couldn't he couldn't feel his the presence of his father. Okay. Yes. Byron? Satan. Satan. Continuing. This, this is from Ellen White. This is continuing Desire of Ages. Satan, with his fierce temptation, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror to tell him of the Father's acceptance of, sac of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation would be eternal. Christ felt the anguish of which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. When's that going to happen? The At the second coming, right? Second coming. Yeah. So, and, and, but then ultimately the, they will die at the third coming. So Jesus went through that second death experience for us to show us what it was like. That awful feeling of despair Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine. It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. It's Desire of Ages, page 753. Okay, now, the wrath of God upon him. What does that mean? The separation. The, the separation. Through those when, portals of the tomb. When we sin, we're say, what are we saying to God? Step back, leave me alone, I want to do it my way. That's what Lucifer said, right? In heaven, right there next to God. Genesis 1, Then God said, and now we will make human beings, they will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all animals, domestic and wild, large and small. And then... In what way were they to be like God and resemble God? In appearance? Well, resemble sounds like appearance, doesn't it? It sounds like it, but 
Is that what it means? A lot of places in the Bible talk about, and Psalms particularly, talk about uh, clouds of smoke coming out of his nostrils and all that kind of stuff. I know he sits on a throne. Jesus came down to this earth and appeared as a human being. But what does Jesus say about that awful experience on the cross? Matthew 27, 46. At about 3 o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. And let me just interrupt for a second. What normally happens at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Or what, back in, in Bible times, what happened at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? It was the sacrifice, wasn't it? That was the afternoon sacrifice, right. He shouted, Eli, Eli, lama sapakthani, which means, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? And not, why are you killing me? A lot of people seem to think. And when we talk about, when we talk about God's wrath being poured out on Jesus, we're saying God is stepping back from him, letting him suffer the consequences of what it would be like if he were a sinner. Jesus wasn't, but this is what will happen to sinners in the end. So, Jim? This is from the Bible Study Guide. How can we, as fallen human beings, adequately respond to such an amazing truth as this? What could we possibly do in response? We are told in the first angel's message that what to do. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Revelation 14, 7 from the Bible Study Guide for May 11. Is it true that the creator of the entire universe came down and was willing to die for us? To die to teach us the ultimate okay. audiovisual demonstration of how things work. Yeah, and someday we'll get to see that in 3D living color. Carrie, tell us how what John how did how does John describe it? John nineteen verses sixteen through thirty. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took charge of Jesus. He went out carrying his cross and came to the place of the skull, as it is called. In Hebrew, it is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and they also crucified two other men, one on each side with Jesus between them. Pilate wrote a notice and had it put on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is what he wrote. Many people read it because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city. In fact, it was probably right near one of the main roads going into the city. Uh -huh. The notice was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The chief priest said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what, have, what I have written, rather, stays written. Wow, it was <laughs> pretty definitive yeah. comment, huh? You're not changing it, fellas. No, nope, you're not changing it. <laughs> and let me just make a little technical point. The people didn't speak Hebrew in Bible times and in, in New Testament times. They spoke Aramaic, which is close to Hebrew, but not Hebrew. But many people think that that's the language he spoke, and so I suppose that's why they translated it as Hebrew in this verse. Go ahead. After the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. They also took the robe, which was made of one piece of woven cloth without any seams in it. The soldiers said to one another, Let's not tear it. Let's throw dice to see who will get it. This happened in order to make the scripture come true. They divided my clothes among themselves and gambled for my robe. And this is what the soldiers said. I'm going to interrupt there for again for a second. Um, Many people have said, well, these things, you know, someone probably in, put these, these prophecies in there after they happened because no one could have predicted that in advance. Well, we now have Dead Sea Scrolls from one to 200 years before Christ lived on this earth with these very words right there. Yeah. No, no fudging at all. 
Okay. Well, so go ahead. Did it, did, it ha did it happen to make the scripture come true, or did scripture know that it was going to come true? Well, and God so, knew. Yeah. Yeah. God, God knew. knew and put it in scripture yep. what was going to happen. Gordon, you want to pick it up there? Sure. They divided my clothes among themselves and gathered for my robe, and this is what the soldiers did. Standing close to Jesus' cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, and that's John. So he said to his mother, he is your son. Then he said to the disciple, John, she is your mother. From that time, the disciple took her to live in his home. Jesus knew that by now everything had been completed, and in order to make the scripture come true, he said, I am thirsty. So does that mean he said, oh yes, I, I need to say that. Or <laughs> did God know it ahead of yeah. time? A bowl was there full of cheap wine, so a sponge was soaked in the wine, put it on a stalk of hyssop, and lifted it to his lips. Jesus drank the wine and said, it is finished. He then bowed his head and died from the Good News Bible. Wow. How should we respond to that incredible sacrifice? On Philippians 2, 5 to 11, the attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all that he had. And I don't think we have a grasp of what that means. No, mean. we do not even close. And took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. And I, Phillips in his translation says, the death of a common criminal because he died the death which the Romans used to, 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 to try to embarrass and, and you know, de denigrate the worst criminals. Go ahead. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that was greater than any other name. And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and the world below will fall to their knees, and all, even Satan, will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory, to the glory of God the Father. Good News Bible. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question here very quickly. Uh, if everyone is down on their knees, saying, God, you did everything, things are great, then God should just save everybody, shouldn't they? Isn't there, aren't they all admitting that God is good here? I served on a, a murder trial. Oh boy. As an alternate. On the jury. Yeah. And the first statement from the defense lawyer was, this man is accused of murder and he did it, but let me explain. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, of course, we know that if we put together the rest of the story, this event is going to happen at what point in time? At the third coming. And what's Satan going to do? He's going to jump up. He's rallied all his forces there surrounding the New Jerusalem. And he said, come on, guys, let's, we can get in here. And at this point in time, everybody else is going to have enough sense to say, you're crazy, and you're the one who got us into this mess, and they're going to turn on him. Our Bible study so guy... People aren't, so Satan and the others aren't really changed. They just realize yeah. what they did wrong. Yeah. 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 What an amazing spectacle that must have been to those who knew Jesus before he came to earth as a human being. That would be the angels and other beings from the rest of the universe. No wonder heavenly beings worship him as well. As for us, redeemed by his blood, what else could we do but worship our Creator and our Redeemer? Bible study guide for Thursday. 
So what does it mean to say that we are redeemed by his blood? How has the death of Jesus on the cross affected your life and made it possible for you to be healed and saved? Those two words come from the same Greek word. To many Christians, the death of Jesus on the cross was to pay the debt we owed because of our sins. So Jesus becomes a part of the human race. He pays a debt. There are several questions that this raises. Let's just look at some of those. If Jesus actually paid our debt, to whom was it paid? Was it the Father who was demanding a pound of flesh or something like that? How does this fit with Romans 6.23? It says very clearly there, for sin pays its wage death, but God's free gift is eternal life and you knew with Christ Jesus our Lord. So if Jesus fully paid the debt for all human sin, why aren't all humans healed and saved? If, he just, if it's just a matter of paying someone's debt and all the debts are paid, then nobody owes any debts anymore, right? And if nobody owes any debts anymore, God should be able to save everybody, right? But it's not a question of paying the, the debt. Okay. It's much more. Jesus Christ was the only person who has ever lived on this earth who never sinned. So why would the death of the only completely innocent person pay the debt for sin of all the sinners? Is the death of Jesus supposed to change us in some way? And if so, how? Or does this change take place only in the records of heaven, where my slate is wiped clean so that God does not recognize that I'm a sinner? I don't know what you were taught, but when I was little, that was the standard jargon. You know, every, every all day long as you commit various sins, they're written on the board up there, and then you get down on your knees at bedtime and you say, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me of all my sins. And that takes care of it, right? Not according to Ezekiel 18 and Ezekiel 33. <laughs> it says if you adopt doing the bad things, you'll, you'll, sa you'll save yourself. Yeah. But not just that Jesus will come along and pay a penalty for you. And does anybody learn when somebody pays your penalty for you? Well, unfortunately, that often I, leads to people just doing it over again. Of course. But to children, maybe there is some point in saying, if you confess yeah. your sins, he'll wipe them yeah. out. To children. Yes. Not to even seven-year-olds. If God the Father is omniscient, meaning he knows everything in advance, why did Jesus need to plead with him? He's not going to... Father already knows. The that, Bible... Huh? That metaphor is, is twisted. <laughs> well, and, and again, like Gordon said, it might be okay for children. Yeah, I, that, I, I will give him space for that. <laughs> yeah. The Bible tells us that God does not change his mind. So what happens? And just look at this verse, 1 Samuel 15, 29. You want to read that, Jim? Israel's majestic God does not lie or change his mind. He is not a human being. He does not change his mind. Goodness, Bible. So Jesus is pleading with him to do what? No, what he's Keep doing the is same pleading mind? with human beings to uh, listen and take it, the, the prescription. Well, and this prescription if, is... If we had time, we would look at verses we've looked at many times, Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, and Daniel 7, 9 and 10, where it says, Satan is the one who's accusing us, Jesus is the one who's defending us, and he's doing this before the entire universe. At least 100 million angels up there, according to the numbers that the Bible gives us. So they need to know that Okay, God is bringing a bunch of these people up here. Are they, is it safe to live no, next door to these characters? Ultimately, the choice that we will have to make before the world can come to an end is whether we will worship a loving God or a selfish Satan. Which one do we want to be more like? Carrie? I'm sorry, I was listening to up there and wondering what was happening there. <laughs> You're coming through. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, worship addresses the most fundamental aspect of human existence in that it has to do with what humans as living creatures should do when confronted by the presence of the Creator. Only those who are alive can worship the Lord. The dead cannot praise and worship Him. 
The one who created us invites us to surrender our lives in the act of worship in order to receive them back from him, enriched to be used for the benefit of others. Worship has to do with the very nature and purpose of our existence and with the need for having a center outside of themselves that frees us from selfishness. Not to worship God is to lose our reason for existence. It is to exist in a state of disorientation and therefore to be dying, heading to total extinction because we are disconnected from the very source of life. And that's from an article that hasn't been published yet by Angel Manuel Rodriguez, The Closing of the Cosmic Conflict, The Role of the Three Angels' Messages, but it's quoted in our Bible study guide for Friday. Ellen White takes this amazing sacrifice to its ultimate end by stating, Gordon? From uh, Christ's Object Lessons, in the parable, the shepherd goes out to search for one sheep the very least that can be numbered. So if there had been but one lost soul, Christ would have died for that one. Christ's wow. Object Lessons, 167, 187. He would have died for one person. So what, what went on for that, for the, that benefited that person? Well, obviously... I mean, we know he died, but how, how does that affect that person's future? Well, the way I would answer that is that the issues are not about us. We're all sinners. God knows we're sinners. The universe knows that we're sinners. The, the great controversy happened for us to learn something, but it happened to justify God and all of his actions in dealing with Satan, basically. Tell you, Satan is a liar. God is the one that's telling us the truth. And God, would, God needed to do that even if only one person got the message. Uh, he, he needed to do that for the benefit of the entire onlooking universe. So if evolution were true, who would we worship? The apes, or the fish, or the slime, or the one-celled organisms that they say are supposed to be our ancestors? Scarabs or frogs or... <laughs> <laughs> if God does not exist, think of all the lies the Bible is trying to perpetrate on us. We did not evolve. We are not just a genetic accident. We are much more than just the most advanced member of the animal kingdom. God created us to partake of his nature. You only have to look at one birth of a child mm -hmm. to just go, I don't know how you believe in evolution when everything is so perfect in this one. Yeah, yeah. From the Bible study guide for, um, oh. This is it's a page. Long. Okay, we'll get to that one at the end. This week's lesson explores the, significant, the significance of creation itself. After all, what can anything else we believe as Christians mean or even become sensible apart from us as being created by God? Notice the opening lines of the Bible. In the opening chapter of Genesis 1, they don't talk about justification by faith alone, do they? They say nothing about life, the death, the resurrection, the high priestly ministry of Jesus either. Not a word about the second coming. Total silence on the Ten Commandments and the eternal per perpetuity of God's law. Nothing about the state of the dead. Why? The answer is really simple. These doctrines, however important, become meaningless dribble, pure and utter nonsense, uh, nonsense apart from the doctrine of creation itself, apart from the opening line, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'll pick it up there. In November 19, 1998, Charles Colson wrote an article entitled Astronauts Who Found God, A Spiritual View of Space. In it, he said, astronaut John Glenn's return to outer space 36 years after his awe-inspiring orbit around the Earth is a reminder of the kind of heroism that makes space exploration possible. Glenn told reporters in 1998, just after returning at the age of 77 from his final trip into space, that, quote, to look out at this kind of creation and not believe in God is, to me, impossible. 
it just strengthens my faith from a series called Breaking Point Commentary, November 5, 1998. People may be unaware that many of the early astronaut heroes had a deep religious faith. Their view of infinite space only increased their faith. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin are best known as two of the first astronauts to land on the moon and take that giant leap for mankind. But you probably don't know that before they emerged from the spaceship, Aldrin pulled out a Bible, a silver chalice, and sacrificial bread and wine. There on the moon, his first act was to celebrate communion. Frank Borman was commander of the first space crew to travel beyond Earth's orbit, looking down on the Earth from 250,000 miles away. Borman radioed back a message quoting Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the Earth. As he later explained, I had an enormous feeling that there had to be a power greater than any of us, that there was a God, that there was indeed a beginning. Again, from that same source and quoted in our Bible study guide. We need to recognize that the message of the three angels was specifically designed by God to meet the evolutionary, humanistic, postmodern challenges of the generation in which we live. When we say humanistic, what are we saying? That everything is all about human beings. It is not an accident that at the same time that the theory of evolution was developed, God sent a message to the world reminding us to worship the Creator. God not only created the universe, but also He wants to live in you. He has a plan for your life. Uh, Bible Study Guide. When Bruce Colson was 19 years old, he went into the jungle on the border of Colombia and Venezuela to bring the gospel to the Bari tribe. The Bari was a primitive aboriginal people isolated in the dense jungles of South America. They were known for their fierce fighting ability and their violent, barbaric tactics when they warred against other tribes. Bruce was unfazed by their brutal reputation and, if necessary, was willing to give his life to share the gospel with them. He spent weeks trying to win their confidence. No Westerner had entered their territory before. Slowly, over time, the Barry learned to love this gentle, caring foreigner. As Bruce shared the gospel with these primitive natives, they experienced new life in Christ. And we're running out of time. Just say that when a further war came about, they said, no, we're not going to have anything to do with that because we've learned from this man that violence only engenders more violence. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to worship you to hold you as of the utmost worth in our lives, because that's what worship, worship really means. Uh, we thank you for this lesson, which you've had an opportunity to review these important issues. May it change our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.